Let's start. Thank you very much for your presence. I want to thank first the organizers. And I have a special thank to Ambassador Mino Torizo when he was the Deputy Secretary of NATO. He helped Albania to receive NATO invitation and to become a NATO member. And I had the privilege to work with him as Defense Minister. Thank you very much. And I also want to let you know that we have among us the Chairman of Foreign Relations Committee of the Italian Parliament, uh, is Honorable Pierre Fasino. Thank you very much for your presence. And I have two wonderful ladies from Albania here. The lady that led also the violent extremism and another one that works here with the center, you know, on uh, NATO issues. So thank you very much. We are gonna touch a subject which is of great concern for all of us. We may give an answer to all, you know, geopolitical issues. The main question is how we can give the answer to this uh, threats illicit threats from non-state actors. And I will go to some particular figures. So, criminal activity kills more, than, more people than conflicts. Uh, study on homicide 2019, we have around 464,000 people victims of homicide surpassed by far 89,000 killed in armed conflicts and 26,000 26, uh, victims of terrorist violence. Also money laundering. Money laundering represents 2% of 2.7% of global GDP, almost 1.6 trillion, 1.8 billion in the Balkans, and the annual budget of North Macedonia and Albanian police are not more than 168 million. Also, another big problem is the immigration, especially after the conflict in Syria and maybe some expectation with what's going on in Afghanistan right now. And also issues from North, North Africa. And if we estimate those on financial terms, it's around 33.7 million to 50.6 million euros. Also, you know, our region is known for drug trafficking. We talk about cannabis cultivation, trafficking. We talk about heroin that comes from Turkey. We talk about cocaine. And it's obvious now that a lot of criminal organizations and leaders of criminal organizations are working with drug cartels in Latin America. And also we are now facing a new situation of producing synthetic uh, drugs in our region. Another big problem is you know, violent extremism. And especially in uh, recent years, we had this issue of foreign fighters going to Syria. And I am joined by a wonderful panel of the great people here with a great experience. So I'll move directly to the, to the floor and starting with uh, uh, Rabbi Sidrak. He has a great experience in Middle East and now is working in the Balkans in Skopje in the Center for Strategic Research. And uh, he is very focused on counterterrorism, immigration now and other important issues, and also like political Islam, which are questions for all of us to answer. So my pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much. I would like also to thank uh, the NATO Defense College Foundation for this beautiful invitation and the chance to uh, finally physically be present, not only through uh, online conferences. So, um, I would like to give a quick introduction about um, the organized crime and the relation between the organized crime, politics, and terrorism. So as uh, Mr. Fatmir mentioned, um, uh, they are engaged in uh, the smuggling of drugs, of persons, migrants, uh, corruption, terrorism, you name it. However, uh, the Balkan, it's a very, uh, a very specific place, very specific region. It represents the shortest way between uh, Africa, North Africa, Middle East, where all the action is happening, uh, instability, wars, uh, and such, 
and Europe, where uh, most of uh, people who are leaving the Middle East, um, they are seeking uh, protection in Europe or they are seeking a safe place um, in Europe. Um, I've prepared something to, to, to talk about, but I, I would like uh, to skip it for the moment. And as you mentioned about the FTF, the foreign terrorist fighters, and um, the issue with the immigration, and then I will go back to the relation with the organized crime and terrorism. So uh, terrorist groups, uh, they do have a very similar, uh, if not the same structure as uh, organized crime uh, groups. So they have the same structure, they have the same, uh, uh, we say, doctrine, the same use of violence and the same methods. However, recently, uh, the relation between uh, the terrorist groups and uh, the organized crime groups have developed in a, in a very uh, progressive way since uh, it became a win-win situation for them. So organized crime helped terrorist groups uh, and financed them, uh, helped them issuing uh, not fake passports, but uh, uh, official legit, legitimate passports. Um, which can help them to move around as well. Terrorist group are, uh, groups are helping organized crime groups and providing them with the, uh, let's say, logistic and uh, physical uh, protection. Uh, which brings us to, I, I would like to mention a couple of examples. Uh, in Macedonia, one of them, uh, the issue with the passports. Um, I would like also to quote uh, from a uh, couple of, of uh, uh, reports, one of them from the Global Initiative. That, that's, uh, so one of them, according to Global Initiative, after his arrest in Turkey in 2018, he told the court that he had been using a false passport from North Macedonia because Montenegrin police, uh, Montenegrin police were supplying information about him for criminals. So. When you issue uh, uh, is the issuance of, of a f false uh, passport, that's one thing, but the issuance of a legitimate passport, uh, that, that, that's a serious thing because you go you know, to the police station, you get photographed, you go make all the paperwork and, 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 and fingerprints, and, and that's, that, that, that means some uh, individuals, circles are involved in the, this uh, structure. Now the second uh, example, uh, which we are currently making a study on it, and I think in, in, in three weeks it will be published, about the involvement of also some structures in the smuggling of migrants uh, through uh, the Balkan route, which is uh, uh, um, two countries are involved in, in, in such uh, affair where they are in fact transporting uh, the migrants through uh, the entire route uh, uh, and asking like a payment, so they are in fact paying and they are making a huge business out of that because they are charging between 60 and 100 euros per migrant, so you make the math. Um, however, uh, I, I will jump to, to, I will go back to the organized crime thing. So as we said that they are uh, related, uh, the, the, the terrorism and the organized crime. Um, uh, uh, one more thing, uh, when they were leaving Europe uh, to the Middle East, so uh, I, I will also go back to like the first panel when, when they were discussion. So there are a lot of people having two passports, two nationalities in Europe. So they are leaving Europe with, uh, so I will, I will make, they are leaving one country. So um, the border police have an evidence that they left. They are going to the Middle East. They are coming back to Europe in illegal way. So no one can see that they came back and they get involved in terrorist acts in Europe. And then the government does not have any evidence. And they say, ah, but they were outside Europe. That's not true, they did that in Europe. The second uh, component of that, the second part, is um, the, legislat uh, the, the legislative system and the laws in the Balkan, they do not, the, the penal codes, they do, not have, they, they do not have evidence that those people were part of acts done in the Middle East. So they come back, so they pay a fine, or they get three months, and then they are back in the streets, Without going through the most important thing, the DDRR programs, which the ones that we have are outdated, um, and um, they, go, they don't go through such programs, and they are back in the society. Uh, and
and then we have another problem because either they will choose the way uh, uh, an option to indoctrinate more uh, new, uh, let's say, jihadis or, or foreign fighters, uh, or uh, they might uh, choose to commit some act uh, in Europe. However, in the Balkans, it's different because the relation between the different foreign fighters in the Balkans, it's a relation of cousins, of family. So that's why in the Balkans, it's not that, let's say, dangerous or we do not have like a, um, a, an imminent threat that this can happen within the Balkans, but in Europe, um, yes. And uh, the last thing, it's about uh, studying. Uh, you know, you have to, 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 in order to understand the phenomena, you have to study the phenomena. In the Balkans, they used to use a repressive, uh, let's say, style in, in facing such uh, problems. Um, what we did, like we, we learned from the experience in the Middle East to, you know, to, to, to turn it into a preventive one. So I make sure that after three years, this does not uh, happen again especially that uh, also we published a, a, a report uh, about the um, movement of uh, the fighters now that the, as we speak uh, although they disappeared from syria went from libya and there is the process of moving them from libya to afghanistan for its purposes we can discuss them later uh, we have a, a massive indoctrination of isis of daesh in africa happening right now in the entire continent so uh, I suppose they will be sooner or later <laughs> back to Europe. Thank you, Avi. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Sne uh, Snejana Maleva was elected as the Director General of Southeast European Law Enforcement Center in Bucharest in 2017. And she has a long experience working before in legal department and inter in internal affairs of SELEC. SELEC comes from SETI that started in 1998 as a treaty of 11 countries, and now you are 12, uh, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Still 11, okay. <laughs> I was thinking 12 because I hope that Kosovo can become part of that as well as soon as possible in order to avoid any loopholes on this activity you do. Happen, yeah. And it combines the efforts of the police forces and also customs in order to avoid uh, transborder crimes. They have very good projects with the different uh, governments and also very active involvement of the governments of uh, these 12 countries. But the experience of uh, uh, Ms. Maleva is also in European integration. She has been pioneering you know, European integration in Bulgaria. She has been also a strong force behind you know, Schengen, uh, getting Bulgaria into Schengen, and she received a lot of awards. So the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much for the... Thank you very much for this so, so good presentation <laughs> for me. Uh, uh, I have uh, experience, but for the moment uh, I will present uh, the SELEC. And firstly, allow me, but firstly, allow me to, uh, about that. Uh, firstly, allow me to thank the uh, NATO Foundation for the kind invitation. I am very pleased and honored to be here to uh, be able to present our organization as a center uh, combining all the countries from Southeast Europe to fight against the organized crime. My colleagues, uh, the respected chair and my colleague from Skopje, they already uh, spoke about the main crimes in the region and, uh, opa, sorry, the main crimes in the region. So in order to be successful uh, against these uh, different crimes typical for our region, uh, the countries from the Southeast Europe, they created our center uh, correctly it was Sechi, now it is SELEC, and uh, we have already more than 20 years as uh, uh, experience in the fight against organized crime uh, in the region and beyond the region, and uh, uh, I would say that uh, we have uh, quite a good results. Uh, we are created by the countries from Southeast uh, Europe uh, with a mission to fight, to, co to prevent and to combat tran transport crime including serious and organized crime, including in terrorism, to fight against terrorism. So these are the countries that are members of uh, our center. Uh, as I said, we are the law enforcement organization of Southeast Europe. So all the countries from Southeast Europe, they are our member state, united through the center, starting from uh, Greece and Turkey down, going through Bulgaria and Romania, 
uh, up uh, Moldova and Hungary, and all the countries uh, except the Kosovo from Western Balkans, they are also uh, our member states. Uh, how we are functioning, all these countries, they have liaison officers uh, to select, which is uh, the headquarters is in Bucharest, Romania, in, the, in this nice building, it was in the beginning of my presentation. Uh, they work together, the customs and police, as correctly, Mr. Chair, you, you noticed. You have representatives from the uh, police, as well as from customs, uh, working together. And uh, the idea is to have the synergy of uh, law enforcement authorities, police and customs, in order to have better results in the fight, uh, in the fight against um, organized crime. You have also this specificity that, uh, as you can see from uh, this slide, you have uh, European Union countries members of the uh, center as well as countries that are out of the European Union. But after 20 years, I can say that uh, we are contributed to the establishment of trust among all these countries that uh, have a different economical situation, different political situation, even somehow different structure of their state. So uh, thanks to this center that the countries uh, uh, have created, through a, it is uh, through a convention, select convention, uh, thanks to this center, so now they uh, um, establish trust among them, which is quite important component if you want to be successful in the fight against uh, organized crime. Uh, also, another aspect that I'd like to underline and to mention is to uh, modus operandi that has been established among all these uh, law enforcement authority from different countries to cooperate together. Also, I'd like to uh, underline that through this center, SELEC, Southeast European Law Enforcement Center, the, our member states, they cooperate through the center with uh, 25 partners that we have. As you can see, these are uh, uh, organizations and uh, countries. Uh, even some of the uh, operational partners of SELEC, also they posted liaison officers in SELEC, so the colleagues from our member state, they can work directly with the liaison officers from some of the countries and uh, using this opportunity that uh, we are here in Italy. I'd like to mention that also Italy has uh, posted liaison officers in our center to work together with the colleagues from our member state, but also uh, through the center, as I said, the countries from the region, they can work with uh, other countries and organizations. I'd like to mention, uh, let's say with Japan, you have a very, very successful uh, uh, joint investigation with Japan, which is quite far from the region. Uh, it was uh, um, organized uh, trafficking of drugs, starting from Asia, going through the Europe and uh, reaching uh, Jap uh, Japan. And as a result of this cooperation of our colleagues with uh, Japan law enforcement authorities, uh, Japan uh, had one of the biggest seizure of money uh, as a result of the uh, uh, activi criminal activities of this organized crime uh, dealing with uh, uh, the drug trafficking. So uh, through this center, our center that of course it is uh, the, the creation of the countries from the region, uh, we, they succeeded to work also with all these uh, organizations and uh, countries. Of course, being the law enforcement uh, center, these are the main activities as usual, exchange of information, uh, 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 joint investigations, but also beside the operational activities that is the core of the business of our center, also you're producing quite important uh, analytical reports uh, describing the situation, the crime situation in the whole region, in the Southeast European region, and uh, uh, defining the main threats, uh, the main crime that are threat, the main threat for the, uh, for the region. Uh, I'll go just to, uh, okay. Uh, also, uh, in order somehow to close the circle, uh, we had also the, um, a network of prosecutors from all these countries. So you have the police, you have the customs, you have the prosecutors working together uh, because as you know, in the big transborder uh, joint investigation as we are dealing usually, the, the role of the prosecutors is quite important. So having them with us working together, we are facilitating the prosecutors uh, uh, participation facilitates and speed up all the uh, joint investigation that um, we are having uh, and we are doing 
if I use this uh, work uh, within uh, SELEC, uh, this uh, um, network is called the CPAC. These are the all uh, prosecutors from uh, all the countries uh, from SELEC. Let's go back, maybe. Uh, also, I'd like to mention that in order to be effective against the uh, uh, organized crime, that is the topic and the main goal of our um, activities, uh, you have to have the, the necessary conditions for the law enforcement authority to work properly and to work efficiently and to work successfully. So I'm very proud to say that uh, recently uh, we um, uh, had a new uh, more developed operational center. We have a network 24-7 uh, for, seven for uh, connecting all the law enforcement authority uh, of the region in order to, say, to have this uh, uh, fast and uh, easy connections. Uh, okay, so also within uh, our center, we have so-called task forces they address the main crimes into the region. As you can see, you have uh, eight task forces addressing uh, the main, on the base of the analysis of the situation in the region. These are the main crimes in the region. One of them, uh, one of them being also the, the task force of uh, anti-terrorism with uh, three subgroups, trafficking in small arms and light weapons, trafficking in weapons and mar uh, of mass destructions, and uh, also the terrorist group. So all these uh, task forces, they meet uh, regularly, the colleagues working in the respective field, they meet regularly to uh, exchange views, to uh, exchange uh, um, the problems that they have uh, in their work or the best practices that they have, or just to networking to know each other. Oh my God, it is seven minutes they finished. I just, uh, if you allow me, I just want to uh, mention one important thing. This is the uh, so-called OCC. This is the organized crime threat assessment report that we are doing. Uh, this uh, it is very complicated, uh, very sophisticated analytical reports describing the situation of the crime into the southeast region, the organized groups that are dealing with uh, within the region, their the modus operandi of this OCG, the links between the OCG and the main crime areas. So this I uh, I know that I'm exceeding my time, but just uh, to this to mention, these are the five crimes that are uh, main, uh, the main crimes into the region, terrorism, drugs, illicit trade, illegal migration, as my colleague mentioned, and cyber crime, cyber crime which is more and more, uh, of course, uh, developed, and the money laundering, which is uh, uh, connected with all these five crimes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry thank you very for much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the thorough presentation of your activity and the great job you're doing. Now, uh, I want to turn the floor to Walter Kemp, is Director for Southeast Europe Observatory Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime in Geneva. Walter is particularly focused on global initiative in Southeast Europe, but also in bigger pictures like dealing with the impact of drugs. He has an enormous experience working with international organizations. He has been working with uh, OSCE for a long time, advising the Secretary General of OSCE, but also in the leadership of OSCE. And also he has been working at the UN OADC, o ODC that deals with the particular issues that we are talking right now. And the work they are doing is enormous. They have around 500 people around the globe that are trying to collect data and do thorough, thorough analysis and producing reports that help the decision makers to implement the right policies. So my pleasure to give you the floor. Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the invitation. Happy anniversary to uh, the NATO Defense College and the Foundation. It's great to be here. I was going to say, frankly, it's great to be anywhere after a year and a half, but it's particularly uh, nice to be in Rome and at this meeting. I represent the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. As was just mentioned, this is a network of about 500 experts all over the world. We have a staff of 75 people uh, centered around different regional observatories. The one that I lead uh, covers southeastern Europe. And um, I believe that in the first presentations and, and based on your knowledge, you're already quite familiar with the threat posed by organized crime. 
but allow me to just focus on uh, or highlight four trends. One is the growing impact of cocaine trafficking through the region, both through the Balkans and the Black Sea region. The second is the fact that the transnational, uh, transnational tentacles of groups from the Western Balkans are now stretching all around the world. So I would argue that this threat is actually greater outside the region than inside the region. Thirdly, the emergence of the Caucasus and the Black Sea is a transit corridor for opiates and precursors. And finally, the growing sophistication of criminal groups from both regions, um, manifested by the use of cryptocurrencies, by more sophisticated money laundering techniques, cyber and cyber enabled crime, and also uh, encrypted communications. These threats are transnational. So it's not enough to think, well, that's the problem of the Western Balkans or the Black Sea. These are threats that have an impact outside the region, including in NATO countries and the EU. Furthermore, I would argue that not only is organized crime a danger in itself, it's uh, a force or um, a, a manifestation that's linked to other threats, such as corruption. For example, and we've seen this in the past, criminal groups can be used by uh, security services to carry out assassinations, protests, or cyber attacks. Violent groups like biker gangs or football hooligans can be mobilized to act as militias, join paramilitaries, or provide protection or intimidation, including for politicians. What is the impact of organized crime in the region? As one speaker mentioned, I believe in the first panel, uh, he mentioned the fact that there are cracks in the system at the moment. Organized crime gets into those cracks and actually uh, strengthens them, makes them worse. It undermines democracy and the rule of law. It helps to enable what I would uh, describe as organized corruption, where business, political, and criminal elites collude to protect each other's interests and milk the system at the same time. It contributes to the creation or the perpetuation of stibulocracies, criminalized governance, even within some NATO members and in the EU's neighborhood. It skews economic development, and it contributes to instability and unpredictability. So basically the opposite of everything that the EU and NATO stand for. In this panel, we're also talking about gray zones, and there are a few of them in the Balkans and the Black Sea areas. Places where governance is weak or contested, as in northern Kosovo or Crimea, or where there's a conflict, as in eastern Ukraine. And indirectly, you could say that developments in Afghanistan have an impact on security and drug trafficking, and I fear increasingly the smuggling of migrants into the Balkans and the Black Sea region. These zones, these gray zones, are magnets for organized crime. Instability and weakness, weak governance, for example, attract organized crime, and in a vicious circle, organized crime increases instability in these regions. Gray zones also create criminal markets, for example, for the smuggling of fuel, for weapons, people, and contraband. Furthermore, the potential spillover of the illicit economies in these gray zones can have an impact on other regions. Some of that was already described. Think of the weapons being smuggled out of these gray zones into Western Europe, illicit flows potentially through ports in Crimea, or how North Kosovo is used as a hideout for criminals. Parts of cyberspace are also now becoming gray zones which are being exploited by criminal groups from the Balkans and the Black Sea region. But I realize I'm the second last speaker of the day, so I don't want to end on a negative note. Um, what can be done? Let me give you 12 suggestions very briefly. Number one, stop coddling stabilocracies. Too often it seems that stability trumps good governance. As was mentioned in a previous panel, this is a recipe for long-term instability. Number two, call out the danger of corruption and the influence of organized crime on governance, and work with NATO countries and partners to address it, as the United States does uh, with a blacklist 
of, of people uh, involved in corruption. Three, highlight the dangers of criminal governance, illicit markets, and the spillover from gray areas. Number four, crime and conflict are often a blind spot of the international community. I think this is one of the lessons learned from Afghanistan. To rectify this, better understand the problem. For example, include analysis of the political economy into situation assessments and strengthen analytical capacity at headquarters and in the field. This doesn't take a lot of people, but a few with the skill set to look at why certain conflicts are uh, persistent, even though they seem in terms of power sharing to be quite solvable. Next, and to address the problem, include monitoring of illicit economies into the mandates of peace operations. I'm not suggesting that organized crime requires a military response. That very often ends badly. Rather, that peace operations need to understand the problem and have the tools to deal with it. Otherwise, again, as we've seen in Afghanistan but other places, it will be impossible to build sustainable peace and development. Next, do more to identify and cut uh, illicit financial flows like corruption and money laundering. Furthermore, improve intelligence-led policing and law enforcement cooperation upstream, for example, between countries, the Western Balkans and Latin America. Put greater emphasis on port, airport, and border security. Encourage closer regional cooperation, as was just described, uh, for information sharing, joint operations, cooperation among prosecutors, and making more effective use of existing organizations like CELIC. And Mr. Chairman, I'm almost done. Ensure that countries have uh, accountable, independent oversight mechanisms that deal with organized crime and corruption. It's not enough to have the laws. You need to be able to implement them. Concerning security sector reform, focus on corruption in security and defense sector procurement. There's big money. It can also lead to big fraud. And finally, strengthen resilience among civil society to prevent and resi uh, um, resist organized crime and corruption, to strengthen resilience and more generally develop safer, more inclusive and democratic societies. Inclusion, I would argue that organized crime is often treated as a peripheral issue. And sadly, we're seeing that increasingly it's very corrosive in terms of security, democracy, and the rule of law. And therefore, the responses also have to be part of the mainstream. Thank you very much, Mr. Kemp. Uh, we spoke about the foreign fighters, the immigration, which is a big problem around Europe, especially Italy and, you know, U.S. now, but also for the Balkans. And uh, one of the main questions the governments have faced is the return of foreign fighters. But I also was very disturbed reading that, you know, we're 5,000 trained baby killers from ISIS. And the question is that they have moved around the world with the immigration and some of the ISIS fighters as well used because of corruption, as you mentioned. So my point is what we should do in order to have at least a database and tracking system for all these terrorists and terrorist activities, you know, that come from this conflict area. Well, uh, I, I don't want to be pessimistic. I, I, I will answer your question right now, but before that, if I were you, I would not be worried from the ones that ar arrived already. I would be worried from the cubs of the caliphate. They are still there, and we have to get them back. Because imagine we leave them behind, people from the Balkans, small kids, seven years, eight years, they will grow up and they will develop a feeling towards the country that left them behind. So that's the danger. The programs that we have are not suitable for children, and we need to develop as fast as we can. Yesterday, a new program made specifically for such kids, because that's the danger that we are going to face now. About the, your question, we do have, we, when, I, when I say we, I, I mean uh, many several security institutions in, in the Balkan and in Europe, except for the ones that they came back illegally, and we do, know, we do not know where are they. However, again, we uh, need to uh, um, uh, renew or to update our existing programs in order to uh, um, uh, re re reintegrate and rehabilit rehabilitate them back um, uh, in the society. And the last thing, the, um, uh, the, the changes that we need to do in the law 
regarding uh, you know, the thing of not having evidence that they committed acts in the Middle East. Uh, so I do not have uh, you know, a reason to detain him. And if I don't have reason to detain him, I do not have the, 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 the time or the place how to apply the program that I have developed. So that's what I would be worried of. Thank you very much, yeah. Madam Director, uh, it is a great saying, follow the money in order you really reach out to find who are the criminals and their criminal activity. And I mentioned in the beginning, money laundering. You know, Italian police forces uh, have uh, found out some of Nragheta wanted to invest in construction business in Albania. Construction is booming all over, you know, even during pandemic, you know, this is becoming the business for money laundering. Some of the criminals that are in Dubai right now, they pay 1.5 million euro just to get the plate for the car because they get a title there in order to, you know, they can invest and integrate in that uh, country. And you mentioned cooperation with Japan and the other countries. Is a way to combine the efforts in order to follow the money and find out, you know, this criminal activity of money laundering. Recently, EU came up with very strict policy, but how to implement that in our region? So, as regards the money laundering, it is quite important aspect of uh, the activities of uh, our organization, because if you take the money from the criminals, of course, uh, they are not so powerful anymore. So you have a lot of uh, um, trainings, a lot of uh, um, workshops, just to increase the um, competence and uh, knowledge of the law enforcement authorities of the countries to fight against money laundering, because uh, money laundering is, is very, very important, of course. And uh, increasing this uh, competence, we increase, uh, we will have uh, better results uh, in these aspects. Uh, so that's why in this autopsy that I already mentioned, we have a special chapter defining what are the main problems, what are the, the main decisions that you propose to be taken by the law enforcement authorities in order to be more effective in the uh, money laundering. Uh, the money laundering is also, uh, as you just uh, correct, with corruption uh, already mentioned, uh, very much also related with the cyber crime and so on. Uh, so it's uh, one of the aspects that uh, we are working with in order to be effective. Thank you very much. Mr. Kemp, uh, I have heard a lot of law enforcement agencies for different countries, but also in the reports talking about ethnic organized crime. Is this the right assessment or is more inter-ethnic? Is cooperation, they don't care about borders or ethnicities to do what they do? And you mentioned that stabilocracy and also the work of uh, organized crime with politics, you know, and vote buying, also intimidation of the voters, you know, working with the political class. And that's where I think uh, ethnicity is important. But if we talk about transnational crimes, they don't really care too much about, you know, ethnicity. I agree. And I think that criminal groups from the same ethnicity do prefer to work together. But what we see is, despite all of the talk of inter-ethnic tensions in the Western Balkans, there's a lot of inter-ethnic cooperation among the criminals. And I was struck by what Solomon Passi was saying about the United States and the Balkans. For criminal groups that already exist, they, they very much work together across borders, sorry to say, even more effectively than law enforcement. And I think there are plenty of lessons to be learned there. Thank you very much. And uh, so now the floor is open for the questions. Yes. Can you go to the mic, please? Right behind you. Good evening. I'm General Campolini, former Chief of Defense in Italy. And now I'm scientific advisor at the Think Tank. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have a question uh, for Director General Maleva. Uh, about uh, the difficulties you may encounter in exchanging information. Uh, the exchange of information usually works only on bilateral basis. Uh, and uh, I wonder whether you had any difficulties in sharing information, classified information, uh, between the countries which participate in your organization. Thank you. Uh, so, speaking about the exchange of information, 
I would say that for our organization, it is not just bilateral. So you have this uh, uh, secure network that I mentioned, which is working 24 seven. So it is available for all the uh, liaison officer, for all the uh, uh, representatives of the law enforcement authority of all the countries. And uh, uh, through this uh, secure network that now even you updated as you saw the, the operational center, we'd like to facilitate this exchange of information to be, uh, uh, to foster this exchange of information because if you have one investigation and you need the information now, if uh, you receive the, the response of your colleagues after one month, uh, it is useless the information that you receive. So that's why we're trying to uh, have this uh, very, um, how to develop this exchange of information. It is one of the prerequis prerequisites in order to be able and to, uh, in order to be successful in the fight against the organized crime if the countries, they trust each other because this uh, information is, uh, as you can imagine, it is uh, not just ordinary information, of course, we are dealing with uh, crimes here. So uh, this information uh, has to be uh, exchanged very fast among the uh, colleagues uh, working on the specific case. And secondly, uh, which is one of the great um, achievement, if I could say, of our organization is the trust that has been established among the law enforcement authorities of our member states. Because of the more than 20 years working together, so they know each other and they trust each other, so it is one of the prerequisites to be successful. And not us, not only us, but in general, this is one of the conditions. Somebody else? We have six more minutes to go, yes? Question to Mr. Kemp, you already touched upon the issue of cross-ethnic cooperation and I noticed you mentioned the north of Kosovo, Serbian majority north. Now, um, to ask if you can shed a little bit of light on, on the nexus between ruling political elites in the Western Balkans and organized crime because, for example, the north of Kosovo is an extreme example where um, one person who is uh, the main person of the organized crime a few years back uh, has been uh, um, appointed uh, the deputy head of the local Kosovo Serb party, which in fact, as a result of the political dialogue, is a kind of a local branch of the Serbian ruling party, SNS. So I was just wondering if you can shed a little bit of light based on that example on this nexus between ruling political elites in the Balkan state capital and organized crime. Thank you. Just to repeat the point that I made, that, that very often what may seem like ethnic uh, issues on the surface, sometimes uh, there, there's very good cooperation by other groups, even within uh, political circles, uh, under the table, shall we say. So, but this is not unique to the Western Balkans. This, this happens in other parts of the world. And it often happens in conflict situations that the same groups that are fighting each other during the day can trade with each other uh, in the night. So it's very much based on self-interests. And, and the key is to find ways to change those political economies, those illicit markets, to find enough licit alternatives, but also to strengthen the rule of law and uh, integrity, anti-corruption, and that's very much the type of things that your organization does in terms of strengthening civil society as well. So it has to come from top down, but also bottom up. Thank you very much. Cam, the last question comes from uh, the virtual audience, and this is for Mr. Sedrak. The wider Balkans are a very sensitive region. How can external actors better synergize with local ones on organized crime? Well, I would do. I would. I, I would say first, uh, let uh, the local ones synergize between uh, themselves, as my colleague uh, spoke. You know, you, you you can have a lot of conventions, a lot of agreements, a lot of uh, uh, programs, putting all of them working together. But uh, one one of the things that uh, I think is missing in the Balkan is uh, the will, the will of, uh, or, or let's say, the political will. Uh, to solve that because uh, um, on, the, on the opposite of other countries that organized crime are not interested in local or daily politics in the Balkan it's the opposite they do have a huge interest in that and they do have uh, they do um, 
you, you know you can't get rid of that in, in, in conventional ways because it, it goes to the, to the normal citizen. He, 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 he still, uh, the, he's not, um, let's say, unwilling to, to, to give up this because of his uh, maybe poor economic situation, because of uh, uh, the low uh, economic, uh, let's say, uh, situation of the entire society, because, because th there are several really reasons. So before mm, uh, making a uh, synergy between the external ones and, and the local ones, I, I would first put the local ones all together to work on different levels, because as some of the issues need to be solved in a top-down approach. Uh, in the Balkans, other things we should work on um, uh, down to up uh, uh, approach style to uh, solve them. So that's uh, fast, of course, the exchange of information, etc. cetera. So uh, that was my answer to the Thank question. Thank you very much. So we have one more, two minutes more. Uh, I want to make a favor to uh, the uh, director of violent extremism in Albania to raise a quick question and a quick answer, please. To everyone. Um, well, today here I am as, as a passionate researcher and uh, let's say follower of NATO Defense College. Just a very short question for Mr. Sedrak. Uh, you said that DDR programs usually in the Western Balkans have not functioned. And uh, since you have a huge experience maybe in North Macedonia, you know that different countries in the Balkan has already made repatriations for returnees, former foreign terrorist fighters and also child on, let's say, uh, have been in these groups of returnees. Do you have any concrete examples during this experience where you maybe justify or your assumption is based that uh, the programs that the Western Balkans are implementing up to now do not function? Thank you. Yeah, w well, uh, uh, first of all, as I said, I'm trying to get the experience uh, we have in the Middle East uh, to the Balkans, because the Balkans, and, and we are talking in general about all um, the Balkans, you asked about in, in Macedonia how uh, are the things. However, there is this mentality of, uh, we, we call it, you know, the repressive one. So he makes a problem, you just catch him and you, you know, you, you deal in a specific way. We do have a preventive one, so before even he thinks uh, in making uh, something like that, I should, um, um, handle him. So when I mentioned the DDRR programs, the DDRR programs were designed specifically for other type of um, FTF or, or, or a specific type of, of, of terrorist or, or um, that has to be uh, um, uh, reintegrated uh, back uh, in the society. What I did uh, concrete, uh, I think I do not have the time, maybe later I, I will give you more details, but in, uh, it, it consists not only from the physical aspect of, of, of uh, reintegrating him, but it, it, it's putting together uh, psychologists, uh, sociologists, uh, and all uh, aspects of the program to create something for the youth and the younger people because the problem that we are having in the current uh, situation with the FTF are not, and, and, and I'm sorry I have to mention back the religion, it's not uh, like before people who are indoctrinate, indoctrinated with uh, ISIS or Daesh um, ideas. There are people, there are uh, uh, Christians, there are people who, who, who are not Muslims at all and are doing this for business. So it requires a different approach than the older one that we had before. So may, maybe later I will uh, elaborate more about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do appreciate all your presentations and the comments and the answers and the audience for the patient. It was great to be with you and looking forward to be with you again. And once more, thank you to the NATO Defense College Foundation here and Ambassador Riso. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. people like uh, Piero Fasino that have always the focus to Albania and other Balkan countries, we have succeeded to build good cooperation. So it is my honor and pleasure to give him the floor to this audience. Thank you.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we had a very interesting discussion today, changing <laughs> scenarios from crime to politics to many other things. Now at the end of the work, we have here a person who has been always, as you said before, at the forefront of uh, Italian politics toward the Balkans. So uh, Piero Fassino, since a long time, uh, uh, has a very special interest in, uh, uh, in Southeastern Europe, and not only in that. And I can say, you know, I was Director of European Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Italy during the accession period, and he was Under Secretary, uh, so my political uh, superior, and he instructed me to go to visit all the countries and to write a thick report on each of them <laughs> in order to judge on their on their preparation. So uh, I'm very, I'm very honored and, and, and happy to give the floor to our friend, uh, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Chamber of Deputies of Italy, Piero Fassino. Here you are. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I wish to thank, uh, above all, uh, Ambassador Minutorizzo and the Tenetoc Defense College for inviting me once again to read up this full and intense days of debate and the shared insight. And I would also like to thank the German Marshall Fund and the NATO Public Diplomacy Division for their uh, cooperation that had made this afternoon possible. May I also take this opportunity to give me backing for the Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation, wishing it every success in the, all its effort to build solid and stable ties in such a sensitive and strategically important region. And this is precisely where I wish to begin my reflection, starting with what I consider to be the keyword to try to unravel the geopolitical notes that the Balkans and the Black Sea regions require us to focus on. This key word is trust. Without trust, there can be no stability. Without trust, there can be no development. And that the lack of stability and development only for skepticism and uh, disenchantment. 32 years since the fall of Berlin Wall, and almost 30 years since the end of uh, the Soviet Union, the Black Sea region and the Balkans are still far from being stabilized areas. Let me begin with the, the Balkans, which are Italy's geographic neighbors, particularly the Western Balkans to which we have been devoting a substantial part of our deliberation on the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Chamber of Deputies. For this is the one area in which mutual trust, mutual trust between the countries of the region and between the individual countries of the European Union and NATO is crucial. It has been 26 years since the Dayton Peace Agreement, 22 years since the war in Kosovo, and 18 years since the Thessaloniki Declaration that advocated membership by the Balkans, all the Balkans, of the European Union. Now, now let us cast our minds back to Europe in 1945. Then let us think of Europe in 1970, 25 years after the end of the Second World War, a continent that had been completely transformed and made prosperous by the Marshall Plan, NATO, European Economic Community, and the Treaties of Rome. An area of political stability with, with integrated, rapidly growing economies, and an area where winners and losers were working together to build up a common future by tackling poverty and championing the cause of freedom. Now let us think of the Balkans, in 1995, and the Balkans today. Yugoslavia is no more. 
new nations have emerged after five years of terrible wars, of which Srebrenica is the tragic symbol. Petrospet held out those countries was their integration into European and Atlantic institutions. But while substantial progress has been made with NATO membership, European integration is finding it hard to achieve. Negotiations with uh, Serbia and Montenegro are flagging. Negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia have stalled. And that the prospect of Borja and Kosovo are even more remote. The fanciful idea of the last Milosevic have been brought back into circulation. No papers are appearing that are questioning the border and the congenitory existence of a mono-ethnic states. Young people are immigrating. The new states are refusing to recognize each other with counter vetoes and ancient rivalries raising their heads. Time is passing. Trust is wearing thin, and the Balkans are in danger of once again becoming the area of permanent instability that marked out Europe's history for a long period between 19th and 20th century. Post-Dayton, NATO has been decisive to stabilizing the region, first by providing a military presence that has prevented any more wars and a tank by opening its doors to Montenegro, Albania, North Macedonia, as well as Slovenia, Croatia, Bulgaria, and Romania. Integrating the region is not easy because, as you know, the interest and the hegemonic aspiration of such powers as China, Russia, Turkey, are present in this region. We need to be able to prevent conflicts and not only to fight them, this has been the main historical function of NATO, which is essential today to unravel the Balkan scheme. It is now, to, is now time to decide. If we intend to guarantee stability in the Balkan, we have to hasten the process of integration of these countries into in the European institution. Where NATO has said that the European Union must follow suit, but the European Union must also rapidly reach out where NATO is unable to. We must acknowledge the strategic value of European integration for stabilization of the Balkans, and particularly the Western Balkans. For example, the fact that NATO and NATO country, like Bulgaria, is vetoing the startup of talks for accession to the European Union of another NATO country like North Macedonia is a defeat for everyone because it showed that the past still lingers on and is talking the preeminence over the present and the future. Instability is taking precedence over stabilization. Yet we know that without stability, there can be no development, and without development, there can be no stability. Even the pandemic has been a wasted opportunity. If Russian and Chinese vaccines reach the Balkans before the West, it means that the West is not betting on, or investing in, or even hoping that this part of Europe will have a Euro-Atlantic perspective. We should all examine or our cautions about this. If we don't not fight the battle to achieve a consensus between the civil society of the Balkan, and if we fail to win back their trust, we will inevitably lose our credibility and legitimacy. And today, credibility can ask the negotiation with Serbia and Montenegro, launch a negotiation with Albania and North Macedonia, recognize Bosnia's candidate status, then send out signals of inclusion to Kosovo, for example, by liberalizing visas to enter the European Union. If the strategic goal for the Balkans is integration, cooperation is the choice that best represents the Black Sea region's priority concern. Cooperation means 
means partnership and partnership and integration are not one and the same. The Blexifor Naval Cooperation Initiative between Russia, Turkey, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, and Georgia, the six Blexit states, dates back 20 years. Once again, 20 years on not only have the original prospect and promises not being achieved, they have actually deteriorated with the passage of time, mainly due to Moscow's strategy to weaken the neighboring countries and interfere in their internal, the internal dynamics. The conflicts between Russia and Georgia and the between Ukraine and Russia have disrupted this process. Today, the conceptual framework on the Naval Cooperation Initiative, namely regional multilateralism, no longer exists, having been supplanted by a series of unilateral and bilateral initiatives that are having the natural effect of undermining the stability of the region. As previous speakers have already pointed out, an arc of frozen conflicts encompass the Black Sea, from Transnistria in Moldova to Donbass in Ukraine, from the unilateral nexion of Crimea to Abkhazia and, Abkhazia and Ossetia in Georgia. We are witnessing a policy of fait accompli in which the instrument of multilateralism and international law have proven to be weak and, and ineffective. But frozen conflicts are not likely to lead to stabilization. We have uh, seen this in Nagorno-Karabakh, a conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan that had been frozen for almost 30 years, but suddenly flared up into open conflict in October last year without the OSHA or the international community being able to stop it. What has happened in the Caucasus region, as I set a dangerous precedent by demonstrating the success of military over diplomatic solution, unilateralism winning over multilateralism. In this ever-changing scenario, NATO must also update its strategy by adopting innovative and creative solutions. With regard to Russia, we can see all the limitations and the failures of the westernization of the post-Soviet area, with the fortunate exception of the Baltic state, but on closer examination, Russia's centuries old strategic goal has never been to win hegemony over the Baltic, but to ensure its access to, to the so-called warm seas, which has been a strategic choice ever since the age of the Tsar. And uh, it's not coincident that it is precisely in the warm seas, such as the Sea of Azov, the Black Sea, and the Mediterranean, that we see Russia unilateralism and assertiveness. The question before arises, as to whether the Western state should be updating the strategy of confrontation with Russia, moving beyond a policy of containment to a policy of modus vivendi, from a containment strategy to a strategy of involvement of Russia. In my opinion, there are two issues to which Russia is particularly sensitive. The first, Russia aspires to be acknowledged as a world power. The Geneva meeting between the President Biden and President Putin has been a significant event, a sign of strong mutual acknowledgement after the initial friction, a wise gesture. Because wisdom is what is, what is needed in this phase. Determination in the pursuit of our own principles and values, standing with our unwearing demand for human rights to be respected, and at the same time, patience when accompanying development. The Geneva meeting still has to show its result, but they can pave the way for cooperation. Second, Risho is also experiencing in a seizure syndrome 
fearing that whatever happens on its border will challenge its security. We must free Russia from this syndrome by showing it that no one wants to undermine its sovereignty and security. I remember that when we enlarged the European Union to incorporate the Central European countries, an enlargement that Russia did not want, we did not accept that veto, and we enlarged it to European, while at the same time, the European Union signed its first partnership agreement with Russia to demonstrate that the European enlargement was not against to Russia. A country like Italy, a country like Italy, can play an important role in this as a founder member of the European Union, one of the first of signed Atlantic part and the strategic country within the NATO system. Every, during the Cold War, Italy always has a, a respectful relation with the then Union so, so, Soviet Union, a relation that continued with Russia under the leadership of the old Italian governments of different, different political use that all followed the fall of the Berlin Wall. Dear friends, let me conclude by saying the Balkans and the Sibleksti are two areas that share several features in common. They are strategic areas for the stability of their, our, or for their own region and for European security. They are countries that are Airbingers of rivalries and conflict that are deep rooted in their histories. They are nations whose stability and security can only be ensured by regional integration and cooperation. We must therefore place our vigors and on integrating with Western Balkans into the European Union and on cooperation between, between the Black Sea countries. In both instances, determination to build a common prosperous future must be greater than demand to right past wrongs. NATO has an essential role to play by guaranteeing the common security that is needed to be able to embark confidently on such a far-reaching process. I think really the NATO is the, in this, in this scenario, is the main player to ensure, to ensure stability and to favorite the integration of Western Balkans and to cooperation between two Black Sea countries. Thank you very much for your attention. Buonasera, again, thank you for uh, uh, being here today. Thank you, Honorevole Passino, for your remarks, which are always useful, and uh, from them you see your love for that region, which is uh, a very special sentiment that you have and we, of course, all share. I wish to thank you, the public, here today, because this is the first event in public, as far as I know, in Rome at least, uh, and frankly speaking, you know, as an organizer, when we were inviting people, we were not sure if we should uh, uh, rent a room like this or half of it or, or what. And we were afraid to be in an empty room. And today, uh, I can tell you that uh, we have registered about 100 people in presence here and about 300 people in remote. So this is, I think, is a show of interest for the issues uh, for the region and the people who come from the region, the speakers and the moderators, I think I should be aware of that. They were really uh, heard by everybody and they had a lot of attendance. And uh, with this, I conclude this day your work and I wish you uh, a very good evening. Uh, probably not very fresh, but um, I hope very good.